The Behemoth Brewing Company presents the Department of Conversation with Pat Brittenden. Behemoth, give me something hoppy. And welcome to the Department of Conversation, Debbie Narewa Packer. Thank you so much for joining us, Deb. Uh, really honoured to have you in. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're, and, um, are you, you're sitting in. Sorry, I've, just got a, I've just got someone that's. Some, someone that's just arrived. So you know how you said you're organic? We're around, we're organic all the time too. Kia ora. Oh, kia ora, kia ora. But I was how are you? Yeah, yeah. We're like organic too. We have no we have no boundaries <laughs> around here. So Yeah, no, so lovely to see it. What is it? Bugger, both leaders, two for the price of one. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're gonna have two for the price of one in time. Yeah, right <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for that. That was nice. Hey, uh, you're in Parliament building at the moment because as we're recording this, question time is going on, yeah? Yeah, it is. Uh, question time's finished this debate. They've just um, stopped for dinner break, but of course, because we're a two man and woman band, we have to be around and stick around till the last the last gig. So, uh, and, I would, and I will normally, he'll check in, I'll check out, and then he'll go and eat, and then we'll get our speech, and then we'll this one. So, that's sort of what Wellington looks like for us. And then in between it, we get a couple of like shots and make sure that everybody knows that we've got some points to make up here as well. So we'll Yeah, so there. have you got like a, an allotted slot that you're going to get in there and share your thoughts? Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah, we do. We're 9B. So we're 9, we're 9, we're 9B and um, we um, share a slot because we're a small party, so we sh uh, share a slot at the end. And um, we normally have uh, – National will have a five-minute – slot so that's 9a and then 9b goes to us um so that's how we go on the debate and when it comes to the questions it just is about whose questions um, get up and i guess have a drawn out but yeah. uh, again because we're a small party we get one question one primary question about um, every seven days which works, works out about a week and a bit and then four supplements supplementary questions a week anyway so we don't get to talk a lot so we've got to make um at work and so we tend to use that and our social media platform to get our points across um because of course quite a big day in the in, in question time today because it's the first time sort of you know Ardern and Luxon kind of went in it were you were you, in, were you in the chamber there what was it like yeah 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 no I was well to be honest there's a couple of big things going on today because it's the first time since Auckland went into lockdown we actually Aotearoa cut all went into lockdown all of us and so it's the first time that the House has had all the MPs in there. So it was quite loud. And there's been a reshuffle. So I don't know if you know where we sit, but Awadi and I sit in between ACT and um, National. And there's been a reshuffle. So normally we'd have David Seymour on our left and Simon Bridges on our right. But um, this time around, we've got um, Brownie beside us. Oh, my gosh, I'm trying to think what's his first name. Jerry Brownie beside us. And... A whole lot of the older ones have moved because they're obviously yeah, not in the in camp and <laughs> they are loud as heck. So it was full, the house was full, it was loud, upstairs was just full of media and they knew and they were getting ready, I guess, for this big deal. Um, and so there was a huge sense of, um, and this place goes like that, a huge sense of, oh, something's happening, it's exciting. And then um, Chris got up actually uh, and, yeah, it's done. That's his first gig with the Prime Minister. So he's now full scale initiated. I um I was thinking there's not many people who can admit to having uh, David Seymour on their left. And he'd normally be much further right than most people. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I okay, no, no, he's very much on the left. He's on Rawi's left. And um we Rawi and I um actually we're the only leaders I know that fight about who's gonna sit in the front. And um because I um pull the age thing, Rawi has to sit in the front and he sits in between. And I can't remember who's taken um, Simon Bridges' spot to the right of us, but National are very much to the right of us. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in more ways than one. Um, <laughs> I was, I was going to ask you about that, actually, because I've, I've, got a little, I've got a little clip here. This is yeah. just fresh from the house today, and I'm going to play it so, so people can check it out for themselves because I wanted to know, and I'll play this clip. It's only going to be 30 seconds. If mm. you enjoy this, because sometimes it does feel a little bit like schoolyard this question that's coming from uh, Mr. Luxon through to the Prime Minister is basically saying, do you agree with me that your party is crap? That's kind of what he said. Let me, let me play the question. You go for it. Does she agree the failure to increase ICU beds during a pandemic is quite simply another illustration of her government's 
ongoing failure to deliver and to actually get things done. Mr. Speaker. So I will um, <laughs> leave it there. But I'm interested because, I mean, obviously it is literal and figurative politicking. Um, yeah. But do you enjoy that kind of thing? Because it, it's a that, that to me is kind of a game. He's playing a game because he knows what she's going to say. But is that something yeah. that you enjoy getting into? Well, I think the thing is the whole questions, and, and it's actually quite different for to Party Māori. Because remember, with Dawi and I being in, it's the first time we've actually been um, in backbench. It's the first time that we've actually been in opposition fully. And um, one of the things that's really um, critical is for it's a bit like chess. It's a bit like um, what's that game you play when you've got to figure out where each other's ships are and you've got a Battle. you know battleship it's a lot like that because you've got to try and your team have got to try in that very short time think of a question that's going to bring out um, or expose um, a weakness or bring out an answer um, you've got to provoke uh, a whole lot of aspects of that question is quite loaded and so uh, and so there's a lot of drama there's um absolute 3D, 5D, 6D chess playing going on. Um, but yeah. most importantly, they're trying to advance each other's um, policy. And often the person being questioned doesn't quite know. So just as an indicator, the first question that um, National asked Labour was, does the Prime Minister stand by all her comments or actions? So that, like, yeah. You know, wow, that could be anything. And so her team have to guess what it could be about. Um, and his team have to keep advancing. So it's very um, tactical. Uh, but as much as all the drama and the noise um, goes on, um, the critical aspect is the questions is a, um, a way to be able to open up each other's policy and be able to bring things out that um, you otherwise wouldn't and maybe media wouldn't ask or maybe. So it's, yeah, yeah. Um, it is tactical play, and it's a critical part of democracy. Um, any, because obviously we, we're recording this, so we're going to upload it later on, so we don't have to keep our powder dry. What are you going to be asking about tonight? Um, well, so tonight, um, so the questions are only from two to three. So tonight I'll be um, debating two things. And um, one is about the um, housing um, aspect. Um, we are also... And if that the the changes that they're making, the fact that it may make things a little bit easier for those renting, but it's still really difficult um, to be able to um, get into a home. It's really difficult to free up housing, um, and that's a critical part of our focus. And then the other thing is Oranga Tamariki. It, it may get up before nine o'clock tonight, and there's been some changes to the policy there, particularly for um, Fano and children and, and things that needed to change. So. Uh, that'll be what we talk to, and um, I think we support one and we oppose the other. And uh, we've got five minutes to get those points across, and then um, later on we'll be talking about home isolation um, during COVID and some of the issues that have come out there, specifically from an equity perspective, because you know that's that's our lens. It must be really tough to figure out what exactly you're going to talk about, because I know that, for example, you guys, you guys don't support the mandate or the traffic light system which is obviously massively in the news at the moment. So it must be hard not to just kind of go, this is this is the, I was going to say the hill we're going to die on at the moment. You know what I mean? This is this is one of our big things at the moment, but it doesn't sound like that's a, an issue for tonight. So how do you pick and choose what's the most important thing to to kind of fight for tonight specifically? Yeah, um, I think we, we will always, we, we have um, some bases that we work off and the, they are around our values now, around the principles that we stand for as a party. And that is, always about te tiriti, it's always about whānau well-being and um, you know and I think we we sort of have a, um, a a really strong policy platform and we'll always align um, things like that. If it's topical uh, and you brought up the whole mandates and traffic light aspect, um, for us it's um, it is about you know we probably flip things upside down so from our perspective it is about trying to have a real grassroots community up perspective of life versus a um, centralised approach, everything's determined from Wellington, everything's driven um, from the bureaucrats, so that, that you know, it, it is, and there's two of us, so a lot of it will come down to the, the, the critical aspects of our policy and the time that we have available, because sometimes these two or three things come up and you've got to yeah, you've got to you know, you, you can't split yourself, so 
And again, we're learning. And I think I've already put this out there because of cracks. If I can become a politician, seriously, anyone can. But we're learning um, on how to balance and, and where to place yourself. And so it very much goes with um, if we get an overwhelming sense. So we have very active um, social media platforms. If we get an overwhelming sense, we'll often poll. Um, we get a lot of feedback that we analyse and that will also determine some of our stepping and, and which mm. one we're in and which one we're not. But, mm. yeah. We need more people because it's like Rawi and I will often like, I'll run down the house, we'll high five each other, then as he's running out, and then he'll run back. And it is literally like that. Then Thursday night it closes, and we're just like, oh my God, get me home. You know, so <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot of stuff being around. I, I was wondering as well, obviously, there was a bad result in uh, 2017, whatever that election was, where Māori Party got knocked out. A good result coming back in. And I, I almost wondered that if this, this kind of um, current cycle is good for you guys to almost reset because yeah. Labour has got a, you know, they're dominant, they, they don't need anyone's help, they're doing their own thing and you guys can kind of come back in and go, right, this term is our reset term, we'll figure out how we're going to do it and then we'll, you know, hit it in whatever it's going to be, what, 2023, 2022, whatever the next election yeah. is. So it must be nice to kind of have that freedom yeah. to figure it out. Absolutely. I mean, like, uh, you know, we are always living and learning and I think... Um, yeah, it was pretty frightening. There's a lot on us in 2017, like, um, and then you know, all everything that happened, and we had that period between 2017 and 2020, like, oh, cracks, can we come back? And I think there was a lot of things that happened also for us as Māori, like, in, and we talk about it a lot now. We saw it coming down, but actually um, we arrived, and the reality is is that we suddenly had this overwhelming 70% of our population being under 40 yeah. So, you know, we, we had been built off this really staunch kaupapa, of really staunch um, kaumatu and things like that. And suddenly the majority of Māori became really young. And the, um, the I think the way that we politicked um, was different. It wasn't just a reset. I think it was a reconnect because we oh changed as a um, as a people. And, and, and again, I think, you know, and we're really critical for example, of the vaccination program, we're critical of the public health system because they haven't clicked that actually Māori truly are a very young profiled population, 70% under 40, crikes. So that was a really, I mean, it was a tough time, but it was a really critical time for us to reconnect, to understand our next generational needs, um, talk and move differently, listen a, a lot differently and um, I wonder if we hadn't had the um, hardness of 2017, how mm. we would have pivoted. So now when you come into my office, um, they're all predominantly under 30. Right. Uh, our comms and the way that we communicate, even how we connect to our branches, is completely different. So I, I think anybody that was in it, didn't matter how great um, they were, uh, I think there was going to be that... Um, growth pain, and and we needed it. We and you know it's easy for me to say, but 2020 was really challenging because you kept thinking, oh Christ, what if we don't get in? And I think where we figured it out is that um, we handed ourselves over to a much younger generation. So they came up with the proud to be Maori, believe in you, believe in me. They ran our our comms and our campaign, and still do. So yeah. I think that it was a. Um, yeah, a really good time to understand ourselves and how we'd grow. And mm. sounds like you're saying it's a, it was kind of uh, in hindsight, it was kind of the kick in the pants that the yeah. party needed to move forward for the next twenty years, so to speak. Yeah, which is a horrible thing to go through. But I know, but was, I know. You know, you know. Sometimes when you like you're going through a separation, you think, oh, I don't want to in this relationship to end. Then you, you know, you come out and think, oh, thank God it ended because I've grown yeah. so much. But but I think, you know, in reality, that is what it felt like. But there was so much at stake. And, you know, again, we, the other part of us, it's really important for us as Māori to actually stay connected to our um, our beginning, to stay connected to our value space, to our kaumātua. And, you know, you've got three generations um, going through that, a generation that never, ever had internet, that doesn't never, ever, you know, had the digital um, life that we have now versus this whole generation. It's, it's a real um, challenge. But I think because we talk intergenerationally, you can do it. But it's hard. It's been really, really hard. Yeah. 
So from a policy point of view, talking about having this term and sort of almost having no pressure because because Labor's so dominant with, with their numbers. Why don't no pressure? We still got pressure. <laughs> okay, okay. My, my term. I mean, yeah. I, what do you actually want to achieve, like, within the House? What would you like to see happen? I mean, I, I, I mean, you've got things like the, um, you know, the, the name change, Aotearoa. I don't know whether that's a massive driving importance to you or if that's something that's, an, like, more of an interest thing. I don't want to be disrespectful by, by yeah, saying no, that. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. but I which actually I love by the way because I host a debate show somewhere else and I want to do that as a debate. Um, oh. but, but we what like at the end of the term when you're going for re-election, what are the things you want to have achieved that you can look back and go check our record from the last three years? Yeah, I think probably the most critical thing, and um, and you'll see that come out like you know why Aotearoa? We can't afford to change it. Actually, you know what? It's it's actually about our identity. It's actually about bringing through this younger generation that don't defend Te Tiriti. Um, Māori and Pākehā, tangata, you know, whenua and tangata Tiriti, they actually live it. And it's actually about normalising um, who we are as a nation, our nationhood, which is, you know, about um, embracing our culture. And so that's what Aotearoa means. So those are all, having our curriculum is about learning who we are as a nation. Understanding Te Tiriti is actually about us um, uniting on our strengths. It's not a divisive thing. So I think it's actually about bringing to rise again that 70% of the population that love um, the fact that we have a, a tangata whenua um, mm. of Aotearoa, that we have tangata tariti, tangata moana, and that actually partnerships in the way that we need to look after each other is the most important part. So, and that means about... Um, addressing some of the hard things and addressing why we're so, un, well, some are really uncomfortable about accepting the role of racism and how it's hindered our ability to um, be well together. So, for example, Māori Health Authority is something that we've really battered for, not because we want to see one thing for one and another for another, actually because we want to address the inequities, because when we're well, um, we can learn, and when we learn, we can earn. And when we're earning and all contributing towards society, no one's been left behind. Um, so it is, I think, if you were to ask us, you know, what do we want to achieve, is actually mm. bring about the significance of being united, the significance of accepting our differences and not having to apologise or defend or feeling attacked, um, being provocative to do that, because I think... Um, there is a, a generation that's really uncomfortable with that, but I hold on to the fact that there is a huge majority that love um, being parked and say, Taranaki's my maunga, party is my awa. You know, they, they belong with us just as much as Māori, and I think those are some of the things that um, we want to do. Now, that also means in a nitty-gritty sense that um, we have to address the things that are um, making Māori die earlier and making us um, not learn as well. And, uh, and things that are addressing us as a nation where we have huge poverty, and it's not just a Māori thing about mm -hmm. housing. So, you know, we're really, you know, grassroots, pretty basic, but most importantly, um, if we can do that, we can look after our people and we can look after our planet, um, then we can, you know, look after and, and create a really great economy. But if you leave people behind, we're forever going to, be in a deficit position um, and have complex social issues. So those are the things, but you can do it in a really mana enhancing way. So um, wearing Tonga and bringing Māori into the house is just about, oh my God, seriously? Isn't this simple? Like our kids should be celebrating and wearing Tonga instead of a tie. And so again, they may look like, oh yeah, what's the significance? The significance actually is about asserting ourselves. Yeah. Um, here in Aotearoa, and that's the name. Learn our own history, not someone else's. So, yeah, and I think, yeah, it comes out, I think it comes in the way and we weave and do things, and some of them will be very young and provocative, and some of them will be yeah. pushed through policy and stuff. It's, look, I think one of the things for me, and you can see, I, although I've got a bit of dye in this at the moment, it's normally a bit more ginger, the beard, that oh, I'm sort my, of, a, oh, you can see the Celtic, the Celtic coming out in my, literally yeah. in my pores. I'm half Irish, yeah. <laughs> Good. Oh, excellent. Perfect. Um, I've always said, I said this when I had Emma Espiner on, and it's a clip that's kind of stayed going viral 
the last sort of few months is that the way I've always approached, um, you, you talk about Aotearoa in our history, is that even though I don't have Māori blood, the Māori story is a part of my story because I'm part of this country. So it's got, to, it's got to be. So people have to accept that if you're a New Zealander, if you're a Kiwi, if you're part of this land, if you're part of the story of this country, then the Māori, uh, Māori story is a part of your story. Absolutely. So, and you know, that's I love how it. we should be, the fact that our ancestors looked after everyone else. My mother's Irish. Um, she's a better real speaker than my dad. It's, you know, actually probably better than everyone up until she <laughs> had the aneurysm. And the thing is that at no stage was it intended that we didn't truly look after each other. And you come to my whanau, even to this day, um, my whanau will stand up for everyone else and put themselves last, which is some of the things we saw go down even in the COVID space is that, you know, some of them wouldn't go and look after themselves till they knew that their kids and everyone else was done. That's just a collective way of looking after each other. But where I was going to go with this comment is that I think the um, the unity um, aspect for us is really important, but we shouldn't have to do it by defending our uniqueness all the time. It, just because you're pro Māori doesn't mean you're anti your Pākehā or your European, whatever other side. Yeah. But I think that's a dialogue that is... Um, has got a generation that hasn't been raised with it, and I get it, I get it, but it doesn't mean we have to halt because they're not comfortable. It's, it's also quite a simple concept to understand if you remove the what some people think is the emotion from it. That's like people who fight for breast cancer doesn't mean they're saying, screw you, colon cancer. It just means they're saying yes for that and they support other things as well, you know? It's, that's right, that's right. But the other side of it too, it's so funny because, um, you know, I often will sit to, sit to my mum when you were talking about the awa and the maunga. One of the things I'm really passionate about is the, um, the seabed mining and leaving the seabed mining. There are so many things we come together on and protecting our environment and our planet is one of them. It doesn't matter what race. When you come home, those in Taranaki will absolutely, there is no way that our tangata tariti, the you know, Pākehā whānau I've grown up with, don't think they have a responsibility to protect their ocean. So, yeah, we already do it. I just think sometimes it gets complicated when somebody thinks you're taking something off someone else to do it. Right. We already right. live it. Hey, um, a question that actually ties quite nicely into this that I was thinking of before, because you talked about bringing into the house taonga um, and, you know, treasures and that. I was thinking about this from, like, um, what is precious to Māori, and I was thinking, where is the line between cultural appropriation mm. and cultural appreciation? Like as a as a New Zealander, where like like we've all had uh, conversations around you know who should and shouldn't wear uh, uh, various moko and that kind of stuff. But do you have a have a thought around where that line would be? Like we see people wearing greenstone all the time, and that seems to be acceptable these days. But do you? Yeah, can you have a? Maybe you've never thought of this before, but is there a line? Where is the line? How do you know that line between? maybe bringing in those treasures that anyone can have in the country and bringing in those treasures that only Māori should have. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I always think that if you don't know, go and ask. And it's not just on Māori, it's on anything, you know. But I think uh, I give tongue all the time um, and it has Māori in it and um, people who are special Māori Pākehā, what, uh, Pacifica, you know, that to me is about passing on Māori and something that you gift i think when it comes to things that are about waka papa and wearing waka papa i think that's something that um needs to be determined and discussed and again i uh, i have a view on um if something's waka papa taonga that you should have waka papa um but i also respect the fact that uh whanau hapu have their own views when it comes to um cultural appropriation i think that depends on when you're charging or making something from that and not giving respect to the mana of Tonga. So for me, um, when I give Greenstone, it's not just because it's got Modi, it's actually to protect people. And right. I think that's the difference. Is if you want something that's hugely significant to you and it comes from who gave it to you. And so in order to give something of Waka Papa to somebody, there has to be a waka papa connection. In order to give a tonga to somebody, it's love and protection. But if you're using it to, um, I, I guess, to exploit or to uh, make um, a commercial gain from without respecting the essence of it, 
then yeah. I, I mean, I'm like a, I'm a pretty simple person, and I just think, you know, there's a lot we don't know. Just ask, and because we're all learning, and I think we should never even pretend we know everything. Because, God, you know, I'm I'm learning all the time about um, the best way. But I I do think it's always, always about respect and dignity to the tongue that you've given, and the purpose that you have it. And that must tie quite easily back to the foreshore and seabed, because talking about commercial, you know, commercial things made from people who aren't connected to the connected to the area or the land or the whatever, mm-hmm. that, 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 that literally just ties into exactly what you said, eh? Yeah, yeah. This is, I, look, I, I think sometimes we overthink things, and to me, it's just about common common respect, and you know, these things that uh, we all um, practice and do and respect and regard. And um, when we don't know, then there's always someone alive to ask. When you choose not to ask, it's because you don't want to know the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bl- blissful ignorance, willful yeah. ignorance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you were talking, you talked a couple of times about the treaty, and and I read, I think I read a piece from you in the Herald, oh, and God. you uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the no mandates, no traffic lights, and the the objection to that, one of that was tied back to. Uh, the treaty and self determination, you know, uh, Tino Ranga Tiratanga. And I was wondering if, because I was wondering if you could explain that to me in a bit more, because I talk to a lot of people um, who are not fans of, let's say, the vaccine or the mandate or the rollout or whatever. And what they do is they, they cite the Bill of Rights and they cite that as something that's being broken. In the Bill of Rights, and they talk about the freedom of movement, freedom of assembly. In the Bill of Rights, there is a provision for halting some of those rights, for example, under a national, like when there's a national issue, they can. Is there anything within the treaty that's similar to that? Or does the treaty stand as it is all the time and it's unchangeable? Yeah. I mean, the, the treaty stands as it is. Um, it's, it lives because it asserts as a state of tenoranga tiratanga, which in short means your ability to self-determine, um, your ability as the Indigenous people side by side um, with those who, who settled here to be able to self-determine. And um, it didn't state that you self-determine um, under the state. It actually said right. equally. So um, the purpose of equality from the Indigenous perspective is be able to sit there and say, well, actually, there's some things we probably would have done a hell of a lot better. So we, we don't support mandates in the way that the, the government has enacted it. What we support is that I guarantee you, if you had a said to my aunties, you go and you manage this marae and you tell them how you're going to mandate, they would have been more scarier and more complied with than any you know, um, government. What the government's done is it's assumed um, that, that some of our communities, our kura, our kohanga, those aunties, um, can't do it. They would have done it better they would have done it in a way that included everybody, and they would have done it in a way that said, right, um, uncle has passed away. You're vaccinated, you're not. You're going to get tested before you're allowed on the marae. You're not. Now, those are things that they would have done and arranged before. It's the same way they can organise overnight thousands of coming together for a tangi. And again, this is this is a setting, and I bet it's in your whanau too, with your background. This is a setting that has existed and be a legacy passed on for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And it's a way that we practiced and were able to get this far through some pretty um, shit time, excuse me. So I, and I think the opportunity missed is that the government's panicked. It's assumed that the public health response is the right response. The public health response isn't known in some of our hoods. So I've never seen the public health system in their hood. And when they do, it's normally attached to the police or on the tamariki wins. So there's just an absolute minimal trust. Our way, and I, and I don't think it's just a Māori way. I think the community whānau um, collective way would have kept everybody together and been a lot more scary. You know, a lot more scarier to actually comply with than the government's way. At the moment, we don't. I mean, you know, somebody's these 26 instead of 25 at a marae and pātia. Who's going to monitor that? Somebody comes through in a car and they've got 11 versus 10. Who's going to monitor that? It's that mm-hmm. very community, those aunties, that that business sector, that whatever. Um, and I think they, they had a lot of time to be able to do a better engagement around it. They had a lot of time to not rush 
um, this legislation through the House. Uh, and, and I think that when this, this is over, um, our communities have to pick up and still be talking to each other. As a party, we can say that we did that. I think some are going to be looked at sideways and say, wow, you came to me for your vote in 2020, 2023 you can get stuff because you didn't think about me once in your decision making. Yeah, no, I think I think you're right. I think that's not just for Māori, I think it's for the whole country. I think there's going to be a, a backlash. I mean, I see I said on election night, Labour had one term and there's no way there's going to get a, you know, they'll get a majority again the next time around. Just, it's it's just highly unlikely. Um, well, it's that they just let, they let a failing public health system, a one-stop shop approach to everything. And I think I think that's what's so cruel is that there is a way to have done, like we've, we've been contacted about some kids who are 12 who aren't vaccinated and they've been told they're not allowed to stay in the volleyball team. And it's just like, are you kidding? Like these, these just things we could have done, these ways we could have got around this. And um, it's a shame we're such a small island. You know, we, we could, could have done things a lot differently. So now that we're here, like we could have done things differently. Now that we are here where we're at now, does the Māori Party have like policy ideas, thoughts, official statements as to how to move forward from where we are today? Yeah. Or is it the ship, that ship's kind of sailed? No, no, we um, brought out quite a comprehensive um, covered policy a couple of weeks ago and we deliberately um, took our, I should not say took our time, but we did because we engaged um, with a whole lot of um, experts, communities, collectives, business sector, iwi sectors, um, health sector, and including even the kingitanga, and part of that was to actually sort of get a sense of the multiple aspects of the COVID responses. So our view is um, that, you know, we have to learn to live with COVID now, and we have to be able to continue to advocate. And while we've got some that will follow the vaccination path, we've got some within the communities that want to do the testing path. We've got some that need to be doing the home isolation path. How do we cope with this? We are the opportunities for new economies around this as well. But one of the things that I've seen um, is that we have the ability to really uh, upheaval the health system. And that's our focus. I'm on the Māori Health Authority um, Select Committee and the House Select Committee, and that needs to be our next focus now, is that we can't continue this one-stop shop approach as we learn to live with this pandemic and perhaps others and mm -hmm. perhaps even climate change coming at us. So, so you think that there is a way to move towards what you would have done originally, yeah. maybe exactly what it was, but that's what oh, you'd like to do. I mean, the thing is that, like, there's a whole, you know, the thing is everyone's trying to reset and get back to the new norm. It's actually the old, old, which is, oh, we need to open up the borders so that the big businesses can run again so that the, you know, the capitalism can, and it's just like, yeah, wow. Yeah, what use is that if everybody's sick or you're not looked after your frontline workers and stuff like that? So I think... You know what what we have to do is get ourselves to a position where um actually we have those bold um leadership that say actually he's a new economy here we now know how to immunize ourselves we know how to you know test and analyze ourselves we don't need your big bureaucracy to sit there and keep our communities well we've got an economy around this that we can do there's a mm. whole lot of things that we could do differently um which again threatens the um old old the the new norm's got to be totally I think we're way past the reimagining. If you look out in the communities, they're doing it now. And um, I think to a large degree, they've embarrassed government departments and agencies because they've actually shown right. that they can stand up with minimal resourcing, um, that they have the capacity to get into the hard to reach communities and the um, easy to reach communities. The and and models have really shown some massive um, stamina and resilience. You know, you look at Tafano Waipareta, um, JT and them. I mean, they've gotten out in vans and camper vans have mobilised out from the ground up while Ministry of Health is still stuck in Wellington behind their computer. So I think there's some real success models and, and we could actually do that in education. You know, people have now resorted to digital education and learning. These ways to do things really different now. Um, and I hope they I hope they stay brave and continue to push that. I'm wondering as well about your relationship with Labour. I mean, you, we're talking today about just now about how maybe they haven't done some things so well for Māori and that you think should have been done better. I guess traditionally uh, Labour and, and Māori have been more closely aligned, although I think Marama Fox said in 2017 something about Māori have gone back to the abusers or something like that. There was quite a, a strong statement that came out. Um, obviously there's also been history between the Māori Party and National. 
when National had that kind of super uh, coalition. How is the Māori Party's relationship now with the current government? And do you guys ever have conversations amongst yourself or even officially with moving forward? Because at the next election, it's highly likely that Labour's going to need some partners. Where do you see the Māori Party sitting on that kind of political sphere at the moment? Yeah, funny, you should ask this question because I just saw a photo of me the other day and I did a TikTok about it where I'm like in the middle of David Seymour and Chris Lux. And I'm like, bruh, what the heck? <laughs> and suddenly everyone's going, oh, we told you not to go to bed with nationals. It's like, it's not our photo. But, you know, the, um, look, everyone here, because, you know, we are at the end of the day a, a really tiny island, we all talk. If you have a look, um, there's a lot of things that we support Labour in. The, the equity approach to COVID, we haven't. Um, it hasn't been a winner. 2020, what they were doing, we we're really on board um, and very supportive of the health approach. Um, but there's a whole lot of other things, the Matariki, um, the Māori Health Authority, uh, the way that they've done the Māori wards um, pushing, that those are co that we um, have quite in common. And yeah, we do um, talk a lot to each other. We do um, meet and talk probably more um, in, informally than uh, actually, no, there's probably a couple of ministers that we meet with regularly. Uh, and the same with Marama, with the Greens. Uh, and look, I haven't been a great fan of Judith Collins. Um, I was the one that nicknamed her colonizer, sorry. But the um, reality is is that we didn't have a lot in common. They, they were, they, you know, my belief is that, um, you know, you have to have some common values at least to be able to talk and walk together. So. They were anti poor poor. They rush off to Hobson's pledge to fund some of the messaging. Um, seemed more divisive, a quite racist dog whistling style. Um, so we haven't really had, I guess, the um, commonality of things. Laudi and I really enjoy being able to um, be quite unapologetic in this term. It's it's a position that I think um, we needed to have the freedom mm -hmm. to talk as Indigenous peoples. And I think um, that's given us a really uh, different platform. And so much I think your question is asking, have we made a decision who we would go with in 2023? No, I'm not um, asking that. <laughs> oh, cool. But the reality is um, we will always focus on what we need to. We spent a lot of time um, being subsumed in other relationships. It's not just national, it's, it's even and the treaty and settlements and stuff like that. So, I, you know, I think, you know, we, we get on well across um, with other Māori and other common values and common kaupapa. But those that we don't, we're very open about that too. So we don't have obviously, a lot of conversations to see more. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to say, obviously, <laughs> not a lot of conversations with Judith Collins now. Do you see any no. difference in Mr Luxton? Could there be any uh, any any more, more dialogue there than than there would have been with Ms. Collins. Yeah, I'm, look, I, I, we haven't seen any change of any policy setting um, yet. So, you know, it's, it looks like the same bus, just a different driver. Or, you yeah, right. actually, I can say that. It looks like the same pilot, just a different, no, same plane, but a different pilot. Um, I don't, you know, but that hasn't really been our, our focus. We will always, and we've got to, because we've got so much to contend with, we've got to focus on our values and why we're here. Yeah. Hey, we've got a couple of minutes left. Anything you want to leave uh, listeners and viewers with? Uh, if people are listening, just reminding you, uh, Debbie Naru Apaka, the co-leader of the Māori Party, anything you want to leave? leave the listeners oh, look, I'm just um, really grateful to have a yet with you. It's actually been quite nice as I've been sitting here looking to see if I'm due to go in the house or not. I just want to um, hope that everyone's looking after themselves and it's coming up to a um, summertime and I guess for some it's going to be um, really great to finish at work but for others you know they're not able to join some of their whānau overseas or um, some are deciding not to travel to places where iwi are asking them not to travel to so um, take time out check on uh, those that um, maybe be a bit quiet and a bit still and um, make sure that you're able to support those that may go in isolation and God, if you get on social media can you share some happy things because there's also really bad, bad and sad people out there. So I'd really love to be tagged on all your great things, like whether you're surfing. I love surfing. Um, preparing kai, eating with each other, or just partying. Like, fill your social media with some really great stuff and try and swamp out the negative stuff. That'd be really awesome. Go back to that hash hole, that, that New Zealand hell, hell hole hashtag. That was a brilliant one, saying... Yeah, that was a brilliant one, 
beautiful things around New Zealand. Hey, uh, Debbie Narua Packer, thank you so much for joining us today. I know that you've got a dinner to eat and then a house to get back to. So I do Thanks. appreciate you squeezing us in for five, uh, 45 minutes. And um, have a great Christmas. And I'm sure we will talk again sometime soon. Awesome. Thanks, Pep. Appreciate it. Look after yourself. Kakite.